स्ट्रेटेजिक अफेयर्स सब्सक्राइब टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल क्लिक द बेल आईकॉन फॉर अपडेट This is Strat News Global. I'm Amita Bravi, and on the gist today, we're looking at the National Security Advisers of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Group meeting in Dushanbe. A warm but a little late welcome to uh, Rafaelo Pantucci, who joins us from Singapore. It's slightly uh, late there, but thank you for your time. He's a senior fellow. with the S Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore as well as a senior associate fellow with the Royal United Services Institute in Rusi in London Rafaelo thank you so much for giving us time well thank you for the invitation a pleasure completely rafaelo we're getting uh, these are the first pictures we are getting of uh, the NSA's meeting in S in the SU in Dushanbe uh, but also wanted to get your view on whether the seo really is just a talking shop well i think that's a question that really depends on where you're sitting by which i mean that if you're sitting in one of the member state countries or you're sitting in china the organization is seen as a very useful construct to engage with counterparts in your part of the world um and it's an organization which is the world's largest regional organization by land mass and by population So, you know it's quite a big and influential structure in some ways but if you look at its action and what is actually done which is what i think a lot of westerners probably look at when they look at international organizations you'll see that it hasn't actually done a huge amount it's held an awful lot of meetings um it's done a few training exercises but in terms of practical activities it hasn't really done a huge amount in its now 20 year existence June 15th uh, you written that article there which on the screen when the SEO turning 20 so it's uh, way past its teenage years yeah. so as to speak but uh, on a more serious note now the NSA's meeting the, the last one in September in 2020 was virtual uh, what really do you expect them to be discussing if you were a fly on the wall I mean my guess would be that we'll see uh, the conversation being quite heavily dominated by what's happening in Afghanistan uh the fact that we've had this sort of announcement of a US withdrawal uh, the fact that we've got you know the NSAs from both Pakistan and uh Afghanistan and all of the neighboring countries uh present there uh you know means that it's probably going to be a major point of conversation but i think more generally the organization is one that's really trying to think uh or show itself to be thinking more strategically about what they want in their part of the world and that's very much something that's stirred by china which sees this as a useful structure to engage with a lot of its neighboring countries ultimately to advance its goals so you know the topics of conversation will be ones that we have interest to china which will be heavily steered by the kind of belt and road initiative which will worry about terrorism which will undoubtedly touch on afghanistan but also i think talking about the west and how the united states is approaching the world and probably some pushback and anger against what they see as sort of american bellicosity on the world stage Uh, you have done a lot of work on this uh, uh could you elaborate on what are china's motives for uh, the seo is it looking at its gateway you mentioned the bri but uh, to uh, central asia why did china be a founder member of the seo so china you know founded the shanghai cooperation organization and it was formally created in 2001 but it came from a creation that goes back to 1996 which is called the shanghai 5 which is a grouping that was created in the wake of the cold war as the soviet union fell apart and china discovered that it was suddenly neighbor to four new countries russia kazakhstan kyrgyzstan and tajikistan and um, these all used to be part of the soviet union um, and then suddenly one day you know in 91 when the soviet union fell apart they became four separate countries and so the first thing was to try to establish some relations you know these uh, borderlands that the soviet union and china used to share i mean xinjiang were very remote uh you know very distant places that frankly were pretty empty and there wasn't much going on out there there were loose populations uh but you know it was fairly empty uneconomically interesting place um and then in the wake of the cold war you see a realization we have to define these borders and then as time goes on china sees that this actually is a region that's really strategically important to them so the initial idea was to create something where they could talk about borders they could talk about security they could talk about de- delineation and you know demilitarization of this space and that was the shanghai 5 
And then in 2001, Uzbekistan joined, it becomes the Shanghai Cooperation Organization because Uzbekistan doesn't share a border with China. And then from there, you see it sort of grow to what we have today, 20 years later, which is an organization that has become you know, attractive enough that both India and Pakistan have now joined as well. You've got countries like Afghanistan, Mongolia, Iran, that are all interested in expressing an interest in joining. You've got powers like Belarus and Sri Lanka that are interested in being involved in some way as well. They hold regular military exercises, they have marathons, they have film shows, they have all sorts of a whole wide range of activities um, that sort of bring all these powers together. And I think the, that's the interesting element to sort of focus on in some ways about what China's kind of long-term goal here is. You know, initially this was something which is about trying to define China's borders and relations with these powers. But then over time, you know, this expands uh, to try to understand how China's economic relationship with these powers will play out. Um, and China's been very big about trying to push economic initiatives through uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as well, but they've never quite taken off. Um, but what we've also seen is that China's used this as a way to kind of normalize its position of influence and power in, uh, you know, its own Eurasian backyard. And I think the key thing that we have to remember here, which is that China gives this organization a lot of respect. You know, Xi Jinping, the leader of the country, or, you know, his predecessor, uh, you know, uh, Hu Jintao, or his predecessor, Jiang Zemin, you know, they used to attend every single meeting of the SCO, you know, and all their ministers would attend the relevant meetings as well. And this means that China's got an opportunity to talk and engage with all of these neighbors at a very senior level on a regular basis. And it has a structure with which to do that and really sort of expand its relations as an influence with this part of the world. Yeah. So I think from a long-term perspective, this is really about China normalizing its position of influence and power in its Eurasian backyard. Well, considering a lot of our viewers are very interested in uh, how India and Pakistan's equation will work in the years mm -hmm. of this time, we, uh, this is the statement from the last virtual meeting when uh, G. Doval, the NSA, actually walked out because Pakistan presented uh, its uh, map uh, of uh, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, occupied region in uh, Pakistan occupied uh, Kashmir and there was a walkout there. Uh, SEO is not supposed to look at bilateral uh, relations, right? How does it work when you know you have India, which has two adversaries? You can call them that: China, uh, China and Pakistan, and the whole Central Asian groups as well. Uh, you, got, you were talking about the observers, where there's Afghanistan, there's Iran. I think there's even uh, other South Asian regions. But how does the bilateral angle work there, Rafaelo? Well, I mean, the, the sort of determination that all the members agree to is that they don't interfere in each other's affairs and they try to keep bilateral clashes out of the organization. And interestingly, you know, China and India seem to have been able to do that, actually. While we've seen the relationship between the two countries really fall off a cliff, we've still seen India engage within the SCO at the same level as it always has. They had a, a leader summit in November, uh, which was, you know, online summit hosted by Moscow. Uh, you know, President Modi was there and gave a speech. Uh, President, you know, Prime Minister Khan was there as well. He gave a speech. You know, so they continued to sort of engage and they try to usually keep these things out of the mix. Um, and it's sort of an agreement between them all. But, you know, this is always one of the big questions that people had when India and Pakistan joined. Because all of the other members do have issues and clashes and problems as well. But none of them are quite as sort of contentious in some ways as, you know, um, Pakistan and India's. And everyone wondered whether they'd be able to keep it out. And actually what I would say is it's quite interesting that they have managed to keep it out until now. Um, and we've seen only sort of light spats or disagreements like the one that you mentioned uh, with Mr. Doval during the last meeting. And in fact, uh, it was on the sidelines of the SEO summit in um, the foreign ministers and defense ministers in Moscow, where mm -hmm. India and China's foreign minister and defense ministers had their first uh, talk after what had happened last year in uh, Galwan, in Ladakh. Uh, when you talk about one of uh, the pillars, if I can call it that, of the SCO, which is counter-terrorism, which should uh, uh, involve, ev I mean, e everybody would uh, want to uh, partake in that, though there's some issue there. RATS, when you talk about uh, it's an unfortunate acronym possibly, but the regional uh, anti-terrorist structure. Now that's mm -hmm. something which could again ha have a bilateral issue because an exercise is planned in Pakistan, right, uh, soon? Yes, I mean, look, uh, you know, RATS, it's, it's a really unfortunate acronym. And I once had a meeting with some uh, diplomats involved in, in the creation of the SEO. And 
you know, one of them, I won't name the country, you know, so, well, this is the problem where you don't have any native English speakers in the room. You know, no one paid attention, no one noticed that the acronym in English was quite an awkward one. But, you know, joking apart, counterterrorism is is kind of a useful uh, issue in many ways for people to rally around because, you know, we can all generally say terrorists are a bad thing and so, so on. But then the problem comes down to what do you characterize as a terrorist? And of course, that definition varies from country to country. And when you talk about India Pakistan, of course, it does become very contentious. But, you know, I think the, the, the key element that they try to focus on within the SCO, and this is what's quite interesting in some ways about it as an international organization, is that they do the, the sort of the gravity, uh, this, the, the, the centrifugal force carrying the organization forward to continue to exist and continue to engage means that all the powers seem willing to overlook some of these issues. And while they do occasionally have spats, the overriding impetus always is, well, let's just keep attending, keep participating and keep engaging. And within that context, you know, counterterrorism is kind of an issue that they all broadly can agree is something that they want to kind of do. And when, when they talk about doing military exercise together, you know, if you do a military exercise, uh, you know, involving, you know, fighting against a country, well, then you need a scenario and your scenario has to be against someone. And then by saying you're against someone, you've kind of defined who your enemy is and that creates all sorts of problems. If instead your military exercises are all counter-terrorism exercises, well, you kind of can define it very differently and it makes it much easier for everyone to participate. Mm. <coughs> Big one. Well, you, again, uh, uh, I'm going to bring up a bilateral issue. India and Pakistan, uh, there's been a lot of reporting on there have been back channels that have been opened, you know, the ceasefire is now uh, being uh, upheld on both sides of the line of control. There were reports of back channel talks in uh, Qatar or Doha in, in the Gulf. Though the Pakistani NSA has den denied that there would be any pull aside or meeting with uh, Ajit Doval, the Indian NSA here at the, N uh, at the SCO. Uh, does this give an opportunity, especially because of the NSA meet, which is the SEO anyway, you know, getting information is, is so difficult. But when the NSAs meet, uh, there's even more of a drip drab information. Does it give it an opportunity for uh, things that you can't really uh, talk about to be done at a forum like this? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think that's all of these kind of big international forums. Th this is the key part, which really is why people attend and why it's interesting, you know, going to these big meetings, the part that the public gets to see of just, you know, watching an event with, you know, a long speech and another long speech and then a couple of questions, you know, that's not really why these people attend. They attend because they know that when they're there, they know that their counterparts from a whole series of other countries will be there at the same time. And so they can have a whole series of engagements like that, which otherwise might be quite difficult to coordinate. And if you think about that within the context of the current sort of COVID uh, environment, where it's generally difficult to travel, it's generally difficult to do these kind of big international meetings, you know, it becomes all the more salient. So I am certain, you know, that there are meetings happening here that are intended to really have a, you know, a serious issue that they want to address, which they don't want to do on a, a telephone line or they want to do in person. And this is the kind of opportunity and forum that they can take advantage of to do that. Since at the beginning you mentioned Afghanistan, I'll just get to that. But there's a question from a viewer called Joker who says, is the Quad making the SCO irrelevant to India? You, you mm -hmm. talked about uh, the relevance of the SCO, but uh, yeah. considering what's happening currently, do you, uh, how do you see it going? I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I would argue that in a way, India having a foot in both of them is evidence of India's, you know, strategic playing, effective strategic gameplay, to be honest with you. Because, you know, by remaining with a foot in kind of both camps, uh, which essentially is what India is doing by doing, by engaging with the Quad, it's a way of, you know, you, you keep your options open. And that's really what international diplomacy should be about. You know, it's about keeping your options open, keeping opportunities there for your country to advance its national interests. So on the one hand, India engages in the Quad. It shows it's part of this big push that the Americans are doing to contain China. But on the other hand, by engaging in the SCO, you're demonstrating that you're keeping your door open with China, uh, which is, of course, something that India is always going to have to do because, you know, China sits on your border. So I would argue that that's evidence of quite canny strategic gameplay by the Indians that they're able to continue to engage in both of these parties. A more cynical person would say this is evidence of Indian schizophrenia <laughs> in the sense that there's an ability to kind of maintain a, a focus and attention on one or the other. But I actually think of it as quite a, a clever and sensible thing to do. Rakesh Kalania, since we were talking, I said we'll go to Afghanistan. 
what will be the role of the SEO going forward in Afghanistan in the light of the American mm -hmm. exit? Should India work with the SEO in Afghanistan? There have been so many developments. The Tajik border, the Taliban reportedly has yeah. uh, taken over. Uh, Khalilzad was in Central Asia. Uh, they talk about bases, which the Pakistanis say they will not give. Uh, the Americans yeah. are talking about over the horizon counterterrorism and even counterinsurgency, which is interesting. But SEO, how does that fit in, Rafaelo? Look, I mean, the SEO has been talking about Afghanistan since it was created. If you go back and look at the kind of uh, the the founding session in 2001, they had this big event on the in Shanghai at uh, I think it was at the 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 the, 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 the Peace Hotel. You know, and at that, and you go back and look at the speeches that leaders gave, a lot of them quite specifically referred to Afghanistan as a problem. You know, and at the time, Afghanistan, this was just before 9-11. This was June 2001. So, you know, three months before we saw the September 11th attacks and then everything that followed that. You know, they're all, this was a country ruled by the Taliban. You'd had attacks in Kyrgyzstan over the past two summers where you'd had, you know, armed groups come across the border. You'd had the civil war in Tajikistan. You'd had bombs in Tashkent. You had, you know, events in Xinjiang. You know, there was all sorts of problems, and a lot of them had ties back to Afghanistan. So the organization has been talking about Afghanistan since its genesis, and yet it's done absolutely nothing. <laughs> they created something called the, Sh the SCO Afghanistan Contact Group um, back in 2012 um, or 2006, sorry. And then in 2012, they created something. Uh, they brought Afghanistan as an observer member, and there's been a lot of hope. And a lot of this hope has been driven by Beijing, who's actually wanted the SCO to do more in. Afghanistan. But a lot of the other members, frankly, haven't wanted that because they want to maintain whatever they're doing in Afghanistan on a bilateral level. And so they've kind of held it up. And so, you know, in my mind, and I think in most people's minds, when you look at the SCA, so this is an organization, you know, its members surround Afghanistan, its observer members and dialogue partners completely engulf Afghanistan. So why wouldn't it be focused on this country, which they're all very worried about? Um, but yet it doesn't seem to have ever been able to do it. And the final point I'd add on this is that, you know, I think Chinese frustration uh, in the SEO's ability to actually deliver something, the clearest articulation you can see of it was in 2016, uh, the Chinese created a kind of a new minilateral grouping called the Quadrilateral Coordination Cooperation Mechanism, which brought together the chiefs of army staff of oh, Afghanistan, yeah. Pakistan, Tajikistan, and China. And this was an organization to essentially talk about how to manage the Wuhan Corridor. And, you know, there's no reason why that couldn't have been done within the SEO structure except for the fact that the SEO just couldn't deal with it because there's too much hostility from the various partners to actually want to put Afghanistan in there. They want to all handle it in a slightly different way. So, you know, logically, yes, but practically, I, I don't really see it, unfortunately, happening. And again, it's a bilateral issue, but uh, Matara asks, uh, are, what would be your advice for India vis-a-vis -vis the Ladakh situation with China? I mean, you have top uh, officials, the NSA, so the security advisor from uh, China, uh, present at the SEO. Do you think uh, some movement, uh, talk, at least discussion, would could possibly take place? It gives them the opportunity. I mean, I'm certain it will come up in the conversations. I, I can't imagine that they can meet and not <laughs> at least mention these things, uh, given the level of violence that we saw last year. So. You know, I, I think it, I think it'll definitely be on the conversation. But I think what's also increasingly clear is that there does seem to be an unwillingness. Um, and I'm, I honestly am not sure who's totally to blame for this because both sides are, have different versions of the story, and it's very difficult to know. Um, you know, but it seems as though the general kind of uncertainty that exists on the border, which is the root of the clashes that we see, um, it does seem to be a sort of modus vivendi that both sides seem happy to live with. Um, and I think just the high level of tensions also seems to be something that both sides seem to have accepted as the reality. So I'm sure we'll have discussion about it, but I don't expect any resolution. So 20 years hence, do you see yourself writing another article on uh, the SEO at 40? I mean, will it be relevant? How do you see it? I mean, yes, I think the I, I see no reason why the SEO wouldn't continue to go on. I think it will continue to expand. And I think I think it's going to be interesting because this is you know, this is the first multilateral security focused organization that China has helped create. And it's continued to engage with it throughout. And it's, you know, it, it sits in the middle, its heartland is in the middle of the Eurasian landmass. And it does control or it does have sway over a very large piece of territory. And China's been building through it stronger and stronger relations. And I would argue that, you know, the whole Belt and Road as a concept really starts in the discussion around the SEO. 
And so, you know, in so much as the BRI has now been enshrined in the kind of Chinese constitution, and this is a big vision going forwards, and this is China's foreign policy, um, I think the SCO kind of is an articulation of that. And so I think as long as you've got the current regime in power in, in China, um, you're going to have a kind of BRI, and I think you're going to have the SCO as well. And I think it really will continue to be an organization which will grow and you know, and, and strengthen in ways that I think will surprise probably Western observers who will expect it to develop in a different way to the way that it actually will develop. Um, so I think it's going to organization continue to exist and continue to have influence over its territory um, in an interesting way, and in a way, frankly, that China wants. In a way that China wants. <laughs> Rafael Pantucci, thank you so much for giving us your valuable time on Strat News Global. Thank you again for the invitation. Our pleasure. It's a reminder to our viewers, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that uh, bell icon. You'll get reminders for when we put videos up like this one. You can help us uh, or support us financially also, if you like. The kind of journalism we're doing, the descriptor is given, uh, the uh, link is given in the descriptor of uh, this YouTube video. Do also follow our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram for the latest news and strategic analysis from an Indian point of view. You've been watching The Gist on Strat News Global. I'm Amita Brevi.